Crime Church, Marty, Chapter 3, Live Fast, Die Young. I woke up after midnight on the person in a house that I don't remember. The rug is covered in what looked like corpses and body bags. I checked their breathing. Turns out they're just pale skin goths and black dresses and dark overcoats and leather boots. I have to walk down to the dairy to get some ciggies and work out where I am and what buses are nearby. Worcester Street, it turns out. City centre. Flat streets where people scrap in the middle of the road outside pubs. High rises leering down. Needles in the gutters. I come back and hang out and smoke ciggies and sip instant coffee. The goths need another flatmate to make rent, they mention. We agree I may as well hang out permanently. We get wasted and I spray paint Bill Hicks on the wall of the lounge since there's no art. Spray paint it with a can I've stolen from the roadworks outside. In pink writing. Today a young man on acid realised we're the imagination of ourselves. Here's Tom with the weather. One of the goths with big Bambi eyes and hands so tiny she can't be much older than 15 or 16, she gets me to come into her bed on the first night to keep warm. She's lying about the reason for me, for calling me into her bed, but she's not lying about the lack of warmth. The place is like a chilly Victorian castle with fog hanging in the rooms, wind whistling in the fireplaces. Bambi, she's a Maori girl with pillowy lips, puffy, soft, curly black hair, skin pale as balsa wood. We smoke in bed after we've climaxed a couple of times, filling the room with blue clouds, watching droplets dribble down the vast old colonial windows. She's innocent, this one. Must have run away from home or something, not as street smart as some of the older goths upstairs. We get to know each other, smoking and gossing, and I'm on the subject of weed science and how tetrahydrocannabidol bonds with the sucrose and pot brownies, and she doesn't know what the long words mean, so I kiss her little naive brain. At least she hasn't been irreparably imprinted with Western propaganda. She lets me read to her some lines from Das Kapital by the godfather of the revolution, Karl Marx, till she yawns and I snap my book shut. It's after midnight and we're spilling our guts, sharing everything. She says her street name is Evanescence. Bullshit. I tickle her till she fesses up her real name, Mona. Over the next month... I experiment with sleeping in every bed in the flat, but there's something about the way Mona arranges her soft toy pandas, red pandas specifically, she's obsessed with those things, arranges those in her dream catches that makes me feel welcome. She's too babyish to distrust anyone. This girl lives in a war zone without armour. I need to protect her. Four days after banging her, I have to piss every five minutes because there's white goo leaking out of my dick. On the building sites where we lay lines of alkathene pipe, I can barely concentrate because I keep having to rush off to the portalos every 10 minutes to squeeze out a couple droplets of cloudy piss. It's another two weeks before I'm hurting bad enough to sign up at a clinic beside the needle exchange place on Hereford Street and let some pretty Filipina nurse inspect my weeping cock. She gets me the right antibiotics but she insists on a blood pressure check too and some questions about my lifestyle. I have the blood pressure of a fat 40 year old she tells me. I'm going to live fast and die young and leave a pretty corpse I tell her. My boyfriend, he's a like you are a being, she tells me. <laughs> Sounds like a fun cunt, I tell her. I'll have to have a beer with him someday. My work week starts at seven on a Monday morning with coffee and a smoke and the plumbing boys picking me up in the ute. Every evening I trudge back into our creaky castle, too weary to pull my muddy boots off. I sell a few brass taps, sell a few copper fittings at cash converters on the way home, but I don't make more than a hundred bucks most days. Dinner is always a steamy mountain of fish and chips that all my goth flatmates pick at. Cheap cunts hardly have jobs, any of them. They're all on the sickness benefit. All depressed. We stretch the food out with white bread and margarine and sachets of Burger King ketchup. Then there's no food in the house again until the next night. Everyone reckons they've already spent their student loan money and there's only so many fake, fake accounts you can set up. Every t TV show I watch has got rooms of good-looking 20-somethings living in perfect democracy, all lovemaking and laughter. This place, I don't know. It's really only this Mona chickadee that makes me want to stay. She does shifts on check out at Pack and Save. She dyes her hair amethyst. She covers her childish spotty skin with a mask of white foundation makeup. When we're watching scary movies, she pulls a Pokemon blanket up to her teeth. Just before midnight on a spring Tuesday, there's a wildfire of gossip and knocking on doors and everybody mobilises. The call goes out. Someone deserves a hiding.
someone's getting a hiding. This friend of Vlad has had his son taken off and by his ex missus's boyfriend from Nelson or whatever, and he wants revenge on somebody, anybody. A mob goes out looking to deface the pretty city. Walking in a sweeping line, eight wide down the pavement, we force people into the gutter. We march our boots and dreadlocks through Worcester and High Street and Cathedral Square. Tourists see us coming across the road. We drift up the north end of Manchester through the posh neon restaurants of Merivale. We unchain some rich people's dogs. We shake their lop rabbits out of their cages. We are starting a revolution of animals or whatever. I don't know. It's all unclear. All I know is one of the group is in the Earth Liberation Front and hates animal bondage and it feels good to be pissed off at something. We climb down to the botanic gardens where we topple this big marble statue and shunt the broken hunks of marble into the middle of the road. I've heard Jade Slattery start living like a commando survivalist nut job in the bushes somewhere in Hagley Park and I, I pause to wonder for a second if we'll step in one of his bear traps. Then we're on the move again. Forget Jade Slattery and forget Joel Lynn. He was a lousy bro. Is there a chance I'll ever bump into those cunts again? We take a taxi to the Rocky Cola bar where it's Halloween and there's a show from this band that Vlad's stepsister is in called Umlaut and although you're supposed to mosh, I wrap my arms around my baby girl and she buries her face in my woolly dreadlocks and we slowly swoon in the basement of black beats and mist, our feelings pausing the spinning world. Back in school it was weird to date someone four years younger than you but out here stuff's different. I'm living on the frontier, just a few clicks from hopelessness. We amble home in blue light as the birds are waking up. We crash back into our wet window castle at 7am when straight O's are going to work. Everyone collapses on his or her own mattress, too exhausted to take off their boots, too exhausted to take off their trench coats, except me and Mona. High school's still got its hooks in her and she won't get her leaving certificate unless she completes a two-page essay on the Anzacs and it has to be done this morning. Mona's head is full of coloured candy popcorn. She is useless with time management. I have to help her. There is only one decent lamp in this flat and its base is broken so I hold the wobbling light bulb for two hours over her refill pad while she handwrites her assignment. After she hums a song by Pink as she laces up and walks out the door to catch an 8.30 bus to Hagley Community College to hand her work in, I watch to see if she'll look back at me appreciatively. It's payday, so I call in sick and smoke a sesh with some chefs who have dropped around to score a riddle in and I end up away for a week at some record and flat playing all-night poker with Chinese meth-head accounting students from the university. When I come back, the bed is gone from Mona's room and there's a blank spot on the wall where her Salmonella dub poster used to be. The flat is going empty one by one and I need to get out, else I'll be left with the mountain of dirty dishes covered in so many maggots it looks like the porcelain is alive. I cram my hoodies and CDs into a black garbage bag, leave my plumbing workbooks in a pile of bills and fines and bake notices and move on. There is this basic kitchen and bar school certificate you can do at the Polytech. It teaches you how to wash your hands so you don't give hepatitis pretty much. You get course related costs and a student loan plus free kitchen knives. The careers advisor at Tech says it's a good fit for me. I pick up my certificate two months after I start. I slide it into my clear file resume along with my Canterbury Cricket Kids Player of the Year award. My ticket stubs from all the gigs I've been to. My Cantermass certificate. My scouts badges, pictures of my parents, one of me and my brother wrestling. I get a new SIM card and change my mobile number because I can't face the awkwardness of Otatahi plumbers ringing me up and confronting me about why I quit. The world is a huge place, plenty of room to run from things. <laughs>